Nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, my name is Narissa Wada, and uh, I'm from uh, uh, Tokyo. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you to uh, talk about Games for Health. And uh, the part that I will be e in charge of will be types of serious games and gamification. And uh, before I go into my uh, lecture, t this is today's index. Uh, I think uh, Becky-san has done a great job introducing me, but uh, I will just kind of uh, draw in more so that you feel confident that uh, what I've been doing is relevant to what you are learning today. And also, um, then going to the global games market. Uh, everyone knows this is a huge market with a huge potential as a medium. And uh, games has now over exceeded the movie industry as a market size, and it's still growing. So it's a huge, huge market. And I think this is because that games motivate people. It's, uh, it's very immersive and it's very strong emotionally to attract people. So if this game mechanics and element is put into good use, it has a strong impact, change the social behavior of people. So after uh, we have kind of a common knowledge of global games market besides, I'd like to go into the history of games beyond entertainment. People see games now as something that is beyond entertainment. For example, terminology serious games, gamification is born from this notion. And also, uh, I would like to define what serious games is and also what gamification is. Sometimes it's confusing if you are uh, first uh, to learn about this. So I'll take time to kind of emphasize what are the similarities and differences between these terminology. And in the end, uh, I will sh uh, show you some examples of serious games as well as gamification. And uh, maybe at the very end, we have some time left to do some activity or pitch in some games and you have to classify which the game is, can be categorized. So <clears throat> uh, before beginning uh, my lecture, I just want to remind you that this area, the field of research, is a very exciting area and it's still in the process of development. So um, there's no concrete uh, definition. In some places it's more clear, but some places are vague. So I think we're at the horizon place where uh, if we are interested in pursuing this uh, field of research, then we have the rights to participate and shape the industry. So um, let's begin. So about myself, uh, maybe I should skip about this because Becky-san has done a great uh, job. Um, I am currently an executive vice president at a Tokyo-based company called EduLab. And uh, EduLab provides a rigorous uh, assessment technology and uh, contents that are driven by assessments. And our clients are like uh, Ministry of Education in Japan. And also, uh, I am very interested in, in, in uh, instructional design and how to create an environment where people can change their behaviors. That's my personal uh, interest. And also, uh, I have a privilege to represent Japan to attend uh, many gamification and serious games related uh, uh, presentations outside of Japan. So I'll explain about that later. And also my uh, former company, which I used to work for and which I am currently an advisor for is uh, uh, known in Japan as uh, Nintendo's uh, education department. We, we developed and uh, produced 
many Nintendo DS and Wii uh, series games. OK, so uh, first of all, by mentioning Nintendo DS, these are the games that I was involved in. These are all education games on game platform, as well as Wii. Okay? And there are several titles for DS iWares and WiiWares as well. And also, uh, in the year 2007 to 2009, that was like uh, six, uh, no, more than that, eight years, six, eight years ago, uh, because this uh, serious gaming and gamification concept became a, a big keyword that the Ministry of Education asked us to do a research in a public elementary school and junior high school to see the game device, which is off-the-shelf game device, as well as the software, can be effective in changing the student's behavior. And whether is there a measurable outcome from that uh, intervention. So I've, I've done this uh, work. And this is a book that was published uh, from Koryosha uh, publish, Publishing. So if you're interested, uh, you can buy this in Amazon. Don't worry, I don't have the license to come in. So <laughs> as a reference, it's a, uh, it's a nice thing to uh, look at. And also, uh, recent works, uh, I work closely with NTT Docomo to create a new platform for students, um, I mean children, to learn. Uh, to learn. And also, uh, <clears throat> a little bit about myself. Uh, these are some of the conferences that I was invited to speak. And uh, as you can see, from 2010, there are many conferences related to serious games and gamification. So that's, I think, was a tipping point when the whole world started, hey, game is a powerful tool. Why? Let's explore how this element and mechanics can be used to good use. And these are some of the pictures. <clears throat> and recently, uh, this year, I was invited by two uh, big conferences uh, to talk about games. Uh, one is called the ASU GSB. Uh, ASU stands for Arizona State University. And GSB is one of the largest uh, ed tech funding company. And the theme was Mind Games. Can emerging game technologies improve learning and talent outcomes? And uh, I was one of the uh, panelists there. And the gentleman sitting beside me on the left-hand side is the, the founder of Minecraft. You all know Minecraft? And also, I was invited for uh, EdTech Israel uh, to talk about uh, STEM and engagement. What can we do better? So uh, my topic was how to engage people to change their behavior. And also, sometimes uh, behavior change does not last. So how do we design it for the people to bounce back to the original behavior and maintain it. And for these uh, conferences, if you're interested, uh, YouTube links are there so you can look at them. Okay. And also, uh, I've worked uh, to support China Mobile. China Mobile is the largest uh, mobile carrier in China uh, to launch an educational base. They wanted to use some uh, gamification elements to create games and provide it to Greater China. Um, so basically, that's what I have been doing. And uh, all through my experience, I experienced a dramatic change in the game industry. First of all, the size of the game industry. Like I mentioned, uh, if you see the, the right bottom uh, graph, in 2015, blue is the movie and the orange is the game. But the game industry far 
exceeds the market size and it's still growing. So millennials, the people who will come into the market as a consumer and also a creator, the first media that will probably stay, come into their mind is the games. So we have to use this uh, powerful media as well, as well as powerful mechanics that is the backbone of this media in a good way. So uh, I know students here are from all over the place. And if you're interested, uh, on the right hand top part, it shows where are the big markets and emerging markets. And uh, Asia APAC is big and still growing big. And also we see countries like um, Latin America and also Africa to emerge as well in a new future. So the market is growing, but the capability and the capacity, potential capacity is still bigger. So uh, probably uh, game industry will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, with this uh, large market and the power of game design and game mechanics, I like to talk about the history of games beyond entertainment. So market increase and also Another important change is how people see games. This is very important. For example, uh, in old days, entertainment education, usually refer referred to as like edutainment, and Sesame Street is one of the you know, uh, known edutainment field. And gaming and simulation did not mix together. Game was thought as purely entertainment. Edutainment, although it has some entertainment word attached, but still an education. Nothing really, really intersected or mixed. But we start seeing in the early 2000s that off-the-shelf games that were created as an education software to be used outside of games. Hey, we're using Nintendo DS, which is the off-the-shelf game device, but we're using this in a public school environment as an education tool. So this is where it really started intersecting and where academic research really came in. So if you look at the year that Nintendo DS came into the market, that's 2004. And Nintendo Wii, he came into the market in 2006. And the uh, first Serious Games Summit was held in the same year, 2004. And also uh, with that first summit, Serious Games terms came into the market strongly. And uh, 2004, I think, is a tipping point for this serious games and gamification trend. Because before 2004, fun and entertainment in education, but not on game machines or using game design elements. But after serious games uh, terminology came in to the market, in the year 2004, now we see games and game design elements starting to be used in serious domains, first in education, <coughs> then in healthcare, then it goes to advertisement, and now we see that everywhere. Okay, so uh, today I'll drill into the terms of serious games and gamification and under these serious games and gamification, there are several types. 
how do we classify them? Where is the new type coming from? So these are the things that I'd like to uh, talk later in my lecture today. So again, just to reinforce what I just mentioned here, two big changes, gain market really, really growing big, as well as notion of people about games is changing dramatically. This is a very good uh, example, which my uh, friend professor Toru Fujimoto from uh, Tokyo University, by the way, he will be here in, uh, in about, maybe next week? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Anyway, this is uh, a good uh, illustration of the people's notion change. It's the same publisher, NHK Publishing. In year 2002, they published a book saying, uh, sorry, this is in Japanese, saying, games damage your brain. Okay? Same publisher in 2012, 10 years later, if you use game mechanics, game elements, everything goes well. <laughs> Right, big change, right? <laughs> Same publisher. Uh, no offense, okay? <laughs> it, it, it shows how our society have changed about the perception of games because they started to understand elements and the mechanics. That's not something to blame for. It's a powerful tool. Why don't we use it and design it in a better way? Game. The government starts thinking. I mentioned that from 2007 to 2009, Ministry of Education started thinking, hey, this is a potential area of academic field which they should drill in. And same thing, uh, President Obama, he had a national STEM video game challenge as well as uh, Games for Impact Consortium. And it all started with his very epic speech on March 2011. He said, I'm calling for investments in educational technology that will help create educational software that's as compelling as the best video game. Video games, let's just take out the video. Games are very powerful, very powerful vehicle. So I want you guys to be stuck on a video game that's teaching you something other than just blowing something up. And games are not just about teaching, right? It's immersive, so people may not think they're taught, but in the end can change their behavior. And also, this is uh, uh, the Japanese government, Ministry of Defense. Uh, Ministry of Defense Japan has launched a serious games research project in year 2013, hoping to attract and recruit talented young candidates who will in the future work in the cybersecurity team. So our next generation, millennials, games are the number one media, right? So Serious games and gamification, is that really something new? I think everybody knows this game, right? Monopoly. It's an it's a old, 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 old game. Uh, in 1904, designed by Elizabeth McGee. Actually, I didn't know that. But uh, we still see today new versions come out. And basically through this game, we learn many things about owning a land and some uh, economical elements. But this is a good example where we're using the off-the-shelf games, but maybe in an education way. And also, another example, does everyone know War Games movie? This is quite an old movie. That's when um, um, still uh, Russia was a Soviet Union. 
Okay. And uh, this uh, gentleman hacks into the US defense uh, military computer. And he starts playing a chess with that artificial intelligence. Oh, actually, uh, a chess, right. And um, then this artificial intelligence starts thinking they are at war. So it starts kind of taking over the system and try to launch a nuclear missile to the Soviet Union. And how does he stop this? Is by using games. He used tic-tac-toe to teach the artificial intelligence. Because if you play it right, there's no winning, right? If the others know how to play, and if you know how to play, no one wins. So in the end, artificial intelligence ran the game over and over and over and said, hey, guess what? By launching a nuclear missile, no one's going to win. So this is another uh, <clears throat> example using games in a good way. And also, uh, usually if you talk about serious games, uh, Oregon Trail is, uh, is known to be the classic of serious games. It's an off-the-shelf game that taught history. And also, it was used in school environment for students. And also, uh, another example that is usually referred to as the classics of serious games is Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? And this is also an off-the-shelf uh, product, which was designed to teach geography. So, what is serious games? What's the definition of serious games? I would say serious games is an experience designed using game. It's a game. And me game, mechanism, uh, game mechanics, because it's a game, it has a game mechanics, and game thinking to educate individuals in a specific content domain. And under this serious games, there are so many types, and it's still emerging, new types. And not only the new types are emerging, but the ways to categorize it in a better way is still emerging and ongoing. And then, what about gamification? What is gamification? I would say gamification is using game-based mechanics, aesthetics, and game thinking to engage people, motivate action, promote learning, and solve problems. I'm not saying using games. I'm saying using game elements and mechanics. So elements of gamification, it's game-based, it has game mechanics, it has aesthetics. Uh, this is the user interface or the look and feel of the game. It, it has a game interface, but it's not really a, a game or the off-the-shelf game that you're using. And of course, the thinking is game thinking. It has an engagement, and it motivates action, and in the end, it solves problems. Sometimes, games do not, uh, I won't say do not, sometimes games are not designed to solve problems, right? It's for pure entertainment sometimes. But gamification is, in the end, to solve problems. Okay, so what are the elements of game? A game is a system in which players engage in an abstract challenge. Like I think you mentioned about Nike Plus, there's a challenge. And defined by rules, there's a rule. And interactivity 
you do something, you input something, you have a result, instant result, and the feedback. And that eventually results in a quantifiable outcome, often eliciting an emotional reaction. You might get a star, you might get a badge, or you might blow up. <laughs> Negative impact, right? But in the end, you have something as a feedback, and from that feedback, your emotion is derived. A uh, system, players, abstract, challenge, rules, interactivity, feedback, quantifiable outcome, emotional reaction. These are the elements of games. So, gamification. Gamification is not using games, but using game mechanics and game elements found in pedometer. Let's look at the pedometer. Ma, uh, I won't say Nike Plus as a pedometer, but uh, it has some aspects, right? It's not a game, but it has a game element. And another impact is the Nintendo DS personal trainer walking. This is a little bit confusing because when you say Nintendo DS, hey, it's a game, right? Off the shelf game. But it is also a gamification approach where you use a pedometer and use a gamification approach with a game mechanics and game elements, but happens to be in a game category and sold through a game channel. Again, uh, everyone knows Ingress, right? Pokemon Go? <laughs> That's behind Pokemon Go, but um, it's about uh, uh, visiting locations. When you play, and it, if you go to a certain location, then you occupy that location. But sometimes, if you don't go there often, other people will occupy that <laughs> location. So it's like, you know, taking lands. And um, this is a mobile game. But if this game element and game mechanics put into good use through gamification, this is something that comes out. Adopt a hydrant. Um, this is in uh, North America. When, when it snows, the hydrant is covered by snow. So you want someone, a volunteer, to shovel that out. So what they did was they used a same game element and mechanics and applied it as a gamification technique in a good use. So if you go there, you shovel it, then you get a point for that. You own that hydrant. And next day, there's another snow. If someone beats you and someone else shovels that, it's his now, you know. But if you're in the game mechanics and motivated, it's a sustainable environment. So, uh, we've looked through uh, serious games and gamification and the definition. So, what are the differences? So, the blue circle is the game element. And serious games is using games, actually. And gamification is taking the game element and applying that through game mechanics into real life environment. Doesn't necessarily have to use games. So serious games, of course, the media would be games. And gamification, game design, which are not just games. 
And go for serious games is for good purpose and intention. Pure games sometimes are designed to just have entertainment. But serious games use games in a good purpose and intention. And for gamification, make user engaged and motivated through game elements and mechanics. That's the goal. Strongly influenced trend for serious games is mostly elements of game design. If the game design, if, if a new game design element emerges, then that's the most impactful to serious games. But for gamification, uh, most impact, impactful trend that we see today is the social aspect. For example, uh, Nike Plus, when you're running, you get badges through a social crowd who you don't even know, right? And you get motivated. And this is, uh, uh, this is another area that uh, impacts gamification. And also, uh, this is another chart that explains the differences and the positioning of each terminology. Serious games, using or developing games for serious purposes. Gamification, using game design in media, doesn't necessarily have to be game or activity. And there's another terminology, game next, but I won't uh, go into detail here because I don't want to confuse you. So, now you start getting the concrete uh, picture, maybe a little vague, but I want to just confirm. This is a model from Andreas Makzelski about defining or classifying games and serious games or the simulation or the gamification or the game for design game mix into a table chart. I'll just give you an answer, okay? <laughs> I usually do a workshop, but uh, since we're being filmed, <laughs> okay? Okay, I'm being, I'm being generous to all of you. Okay, so game for design and game mix is about game thinking, okay? It could be for pure entertainment. And gamification, is using game thinking and game elements. Doesn't have to be on a game platform or game device. Serious games and simulation using game thinking and game elements into a gameplay. But for good purposes. For game, game thinking, game elements, gameplay, and just for pure entertainment. So this is something that uh, is easy to kind of understand. And also, you can define and categorize through gameplay and no gameplay and fun and purpose. Okay, so if the purpose is for good use with a gameplay design, serious games. No gameplay. You're not using games. No game, no gameplay means you're not using games. But using game thinking and game elements to a good purpose. Oops, sorry. That's gamification. Oops, sorry. And if you're using gameplay for pure fun, that's games. And no gameplay, you're not using games, but just for fun, you're using game for design and game mechanics. That's it. Okay? So this is where it all falls into. I have a question. Oh, sure. You explained to us that the elements, whether gameplay exists or 
not uh, it the, the biggest element uh, to classify the serious games and uh, a gamification, right? And you, the the examples you you presented is always uh, using using some kinds of apps or mobile uh, hardware mm -hmm. such as 3ds or so on. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if uh, uh, for example the Rise Up program. Mm. I think it's right the, up, uh, it, yeah, yeah, the diet yes, yes, pro yes, program yes. that is, contains many of the gamification elements. Yes, but it's the the program always uh, do not uh, we we do not need the hardware or mobile phone or some kind of app. Yep. But uh, is it is it the game gamification example? The Rise uh, Up program. Yes. Yes. For example, uh, let me come up with a good example. For example, there is like a reading marathon where you have to read a lot of books. Then uh, like five books you've read, then you get a stamp for that. And if there's a game thinking and game design and game elements in, although you're not using apps or game itself, you're using gamification. So it's classified under gamification. So what you just mentioned about the uh, Rise Up program is gamification. If they're using game elements, game mechanics, put into a good use to motivate. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Yes. So that's a very good question. Yes. So back to serious games. There are a lot of games. And still increasing, I guess. And uh, the earliest one, maybe I should put Games for Health at the top, but largest one and the earliest one was the Games for Health. And uh, it includes games for psychological therapy, cognitive training, physical rehabilitations, extra weight the pain, you know, exercise weight the pain, maybe Rise Up could be the same kind of notion. And as well as extra games, okay. Games used as a form of exercise. And also, uh, we see games like advert games. It refers to the use of games to advertise and promote a product, organization, or viewpoint. For, for example, America's Army is known to be one of the advert games. Uh, advert games. It was designed on a platform of PlayStation 2 game device to recruit people who become soldiers. So people would kind of understand what the life of a soldier would be in the American army. And also, so this is, you know, using a game device, PlayStation 2. Put it in a good purpose, that's something that you kind of think on your, you know, religion, culture, but there's a purpose outside of just pure entertainment. And also, edutainment and edu games, like I mentioned, Oregon Trail, uh, Mass Blasters, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of areas here, Nintendo DS games. And also, uh, there's another one called News Games. Sometimes this kind of overlaps with advert games because you're not only sending out news, but there's an there's a intention behind those news. You know, when you put out the news, it's not just a, uh, a fact that you're putting out. There's a fact, but there's an intention behind it. So sometimes this news games and advert games overlap. But for example, uh, Dafu is dying. Uh, September 12, these are the games that kind of tries to change the society. And uh, it has a uh, editorial content, but still have some intentions behind it. And also uh, training and simulation games. This is a very huge industry now. For example, uh, to train your employee in a workforce. Now this is a big area of uh, serious gaming as well as uh, 
Hazmat Hot Zone is a game that uh, teaches, you know, hazardous places for like rescuers and firefighters to go there and how do you detain the, the hazard that you're facing. And you have to work in a team, but to kind of create an environment, safe environment where they can train is difficult. So they use game device and simulation technology to provide such a training. Another is uh, persuasive games. Um, persuasive games, news games, advert games, sometimes they kind of overlap because there is some intention at the back. But these games influence players to take actions through gameplay. They are designed to change attitudes or behaviors of the users through persuasion. For example, maybe um, like Vicky san your research on uh, HIV uh, prevention. Um, to have someone go to take medicine, you need to persuade. That's another area if you're using game devices, persuasive games areas. And also organizational dynamic, uh, usually designed for the specific purpose of the fur uh, furthering personal development and character building, uh, particularly in addressing complex organizational situations such as managing change and innovation diffusion in a company, helping, pe helping people in organization to introduce productive collaboration patterns and managing difficult meeting situations. And this is another area that is close to training and simulation games, but it's a huge market also in, in the country like United States. So even in this PowerPoint, I think you notice two points. These categories or the types in a way overlap. And also it's hard to define. You kind of have a vague category, but you don't have a concrete, precise differentiator. So Current understanding in the academic area of serious gaming is another uh, one area of academic research is how do we best classify these new types of serious games that are coming. And uh, history of classifying is very important to understand because this is where all the dynamic movement is still ongoing today. The oldest model was called the single criteria based classification system, where you classify serious games on market based classification or either purpose based classifications. Hey, it's, it's for education. That's market oriented. And purpose is to, to change people's behavior. Uh, to, to change people's perception about politics. These are the purposes, right? But of course, disadvantage. Purpose category seems heterogeneous, of course. Then comes what we call a multiple criteria based classification systems. And serious games taxonomy uh, by Dan Sawyer and Smith that was announced in 2008 is one of the de facto uh, category uh, known today. It indexes serious games according to two criteria. One is market and purpose. And each purpose category comes with a sub-taxonomy. It uses 49 categories plus many additional subcategories. So just to show you. Okay, the sector, government and NGO, gender, Games for health, advert games, training, education, science and research, production. And also, if you look at defense, games for health, rehab and wellness, advert games, recruitment and propaganda, these kind of, okay. It's a multiple classification idea. But still, it's ongoing, it's ongoing. This is the new model that we know today. 
classification of both series and game dimensions. The gameplay, is there a gameplay? How is it uh, embedded into uh, the games that you provide? And what's the purpose? What's the scope? And this is the newest one. For example, gameplay, which refers to the type of gameplay used. This aspect is intended to provide information about the game structure of the series game, how it's played. You'll see that in later uh, example. And also purpose. Purpose is the same from the uh, single classification as well as multi-type classification. And also scope refers to the target applications of the title. This aspect suggests that actual use related to the series game. And the advantage is that above three aspects can be used to build criteria suitable for the classification of any video game. So this is GPS model. Gameplay, purpose, and scope. Okay? Don't worry, you don't have to remember this. Let's try classifying this game under GPS model. It's called Stop Disasters Game, okay? It's about natural disaster prevention. And uh, it's released by the United Nations. And this game enables players to take control of several villages that are facing imminent disaster, such as tsunami, giant fire, or an earthquake. Just jump into the GPS model, okay? Okay, let's look at the gameplay. Obviously, it's game-based. And the purpose, it's educative and informative. It's, a, it's about message broadcasting. I didn't put in training, but it could be a mental training to have a trainee be ready for these kind of. And also, if you look at the scope, it's about the contingency. What happens after earthquake and tsunami? We might have an epidemic, so health care. Also, you have to bring back the, uh, the environment. It's about ecology and humanitarian support. So, you can fit into GPS. And one uh, advantage about this GPS model is that it's more descriptive for the people who want to know what this game is to understand and better use it in an intention that was designed for. It's more descriptive. It gives more information. And also, this is another uh, a game, Hazmat Zone, Hot Zone. As you can see, they're using computers, but it's a game. And uh, these uh, firefighters are using for uh, simulating the rescue, uh, many, many uh, hazardous uh, rescue uh, environment. Let's classify this uh, under GPS. Obviously, it's game-based, playing games using game environment. Purpose, educative and informative. It doesn't require physical training, but mental, maybe. And because it's played with multi uh, people, multiplay, it, it has a data exchange aspect, and the scope is for the state and government and public professionals like firefighters. So again, GPS model is very descriptive. If you are a firefighter from your country and you're looking for a game serious game that will help you. How do you find it? 
if the classification is more precise and more efficient, then a better chance of you meeting that software, right? So this is another uh, example about the GPS uh, model. So again, um, I, I want to just uh, wrap up. Uh, this is today's index. I just erased my uh, experience and recent works. But we looked through a global market of games. Two big change, the market size, it's growing, huge growing rate with more capacity because there are many, many emerging countries. And our consumers are millennials that think, what's your best known media for you? Games, okay? And also history, uh, oh, and also about global games market, there's a second big change, the notion, the perception of games from, you know, it, it damages your brain to you can solve everything. And history of games beyond entertainment, it was from for pure entertainment to start understanding the mechanics and elements of the games. And people started to think to use that element and mechanics into a good use outside of games, so beyond entertainment. And now serious games and gamification, serious games is using games. It doesn't have to be apps. Uh, sorry, serious game has to be games. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a good way, and gamification doesn't necessarily have to be apps or using off-the-shelf games, but using game mechanics and elements into good use. And the differences and similarities I've explained, and also the types of serious game and how to classify this. And the intention of classifying serious games is because if you are a creator of a certain game, then you want this to be used in the right way. Then better the descriptive it is. So my final message to you all is that area of serious games and gamification is still ongoing field of research where we find new ways of classification and type emerging. It is a dynamic area which holds many potential. Please take part in this exciting field because you can shape the future. Thank you.